Hello everyone and welcome back to our session on information theoretic estimators and the JODT toolkit. In this final short video of the session, we're going to look at the Kraskov or KSG estimator. To put this estimator in context, let's think back to the last short video where we looked at kernel estimation. On the left side of the slide here, I'm giving you a brief summary of what kernel estimation did. It looked at computing the joint probability around each focus point in our sample uh, by dropping a box kernel around it and counting the number of points within that radius R and then extending in each marginal dimension uh, the box to a stripe now and counting the number of points in each of those stripes to become the marginal probabilities. So the kernel estimation used a fixed box width R, the same one for every point. We must remember it changed our question. Information theory is all about questions and answers. So for the mutual information question, it changed that question to how does knowing the value X within a radius R help me predict Y within a radius R? It left a couple of questions with us. How do we set R? We know the value of the mutual information was very sensitive to that parameter. So how should we choose to set it? Furthermore, how can we correct the bias that came out of that estimator? We know that the values were quite biased. How can we correct that? We could do that by using bootstrap sampling to correct against the null hypothesis of no relationship. And that's something we'll discuss in a later session. We could do that, but that takes a lot of time. We prefer something that was, uh, that was you know, a, a more analytic approach. So to address these concerns, we're going to turn our attention to the KSG method. KSG stands for Kraskov, Stugbauer, and Grassberger. It's also known as the Kraskov or KSG method, as I say. Let's have a look at what that does in comparison to the kernel estimator. So the KSG method, looking at it here for mutual information in particular, the first change is we now use a dynamic box width around each point. So instead of using a fixed radius R, what we do is around each focal point when we consider them, we fit our box width to have a fixed number of k nearest neighbors around each point. So in this diagram, what I'm showing is around our focal point here, we've fixed the box to contain two nearest neighbors, and we've done the same around this focal point here. While the number of nearest neighbors is the same, we see that the box width is very different between the two. What that means is around this point here, we've got a very well sampled region of the probability space. We can take into account the subtleties there of the, uh, of the ensemble. Around this point down here, however, where we seem to have a very poor sampling of the probability space, we can relax. We can relax our radius so that we don't undersample around that point. That's a really good approach. It works very well in avoiding undersampling yet taking the subtleties of the data into account. In addition to this, the KSG estimator implements bias correction. It does that by using an underlying kozachenko leonenko estimator for the entropies and then using the same radii in the full joint and marginal spaces to maximally cancel out the bias. I'll talk more about that in, in the next slide. So there's a few differences there we see straight away to the kernel estimation. And we also need to think about how this is changing the question that mutual information is asking. It's now answering the question, how does knowing our value X within the sample's K closest neighbors in the full joint space help me predict Y? And you can see how that's a subtly different question to what the kernel estimator is addressing. Although they're both giving us an estimate of mutual information. So the KSG estimator is designed specifically for mutual information and conditional mutual information calculations. It's not directly doing entropies for us. If you want to get an entropy estimate using a nearest neighbor method, you can use the kozachenko leonenko entropy estimators. And they're implemented in the JDT toolkit as well, even though I haven't directly spoken about them here. To, to reiterate what I said on the previous slide, the KSG estimator improves on box kernel estimation by giving you a lower bias by harnessing kozachenko leonenko estimators for bias correction and using the nearest neighbor counting approach as part of that, using the fixed number K of nearest neighbors in the full joint space to set the radii we're gonna count points within. 
the way it, it does this it ensures that we cancel our biases in our separate counts of the full joint space and the two marginals as much as possible. I don't really want to go into the details of that in this talk. Uh, to read the full details on that, I'll point you to the references below, including the original paper by Kraskov and Company and some summaries in our book on transentropy and the JRDT paper. One important thing to keep in mind is that there are two algorithms uh, for KSG estimation. There are two algorithms that work slightly differently. They're very close, but slightly different. Before I talk about the differences, let's have a quick look at algorithm one, what it's doing is it's counting uh, or fixing our radii around each point to pick the k nearest neighbors, that's k here, and then it's counting the neighbors in the, uh, in the marginal space x within that radius, and that's our neighbor count here of x, and then it's taking the neighbor count y in its marginal space within the same radius, plugging them all into the equation and taking the expectation value around each uh, across all focal points taken one by one. Importantly here, uh, the psi function is the digamma function. Okay, you can look that up if you're not uh, not aware of what it is. And uh, as I say, the algorithms one and two work slightly differently. The equation for algorithm two is ever so slightly different to this one. You can look that up in the papers below if you're interested. And the way we take our neighbor counts is slightly different as well. Algorithm one wants those neighbors to be counted strictly within, uh, within the radii. Algorithm two will count the points on the radius as well. In terms of choosing between the algorithms, all you really need to know is that algorithm one has a smaller variance in the estimate, but a larger bias. And algorithm two has a larger variance in the estimate, but a smaller bias. How should you choose between those two? Well, my recommendation is normally, normally to go for algorithm one. Well, sorry, if you want an accurate estimate of mutual information, you're probably gonna go for algorithm two. If what you're interested in uh, and this is normally the case when we're dealing with empirical data, is to check whether there's a relationship there or not at all, then you're gonna be comparing against the null distribution. And for that, you want the smaller variance of algorithm one. We'll talk more about comparing to null distributions in the coming sessions. As I say, if you want an accurate estimate, uh, a very accurate estimate, algorithm two is probably what you want if you want that number of bits that relates the variables, but if you just want to know if it's different to having no relationship, it's probably algorithm one that you're more interested in. Furthermore, there are extensions of the KSG technique to conditional mutual information. You can read about those in the Gomez Herrero paper below, as well as in uh, the summary papers down the bottom, uh, summary papers and books down the bottom. We're talking about pros and cons of each of our estimators before. So in terms of the KSG estimator, there are a lot of pros. It's model free, it's bias corrected, it's best of breed in terms of data efficiency and accuracy. It's much more efficient with the data and accurate than a kernel estimate is. And it's effectively parameter free. That is, K is still a parameter for the estimator, but our estimates are relatively stable to that. As long as you go for about K equals four and upwards, uh, it's very stable to, uh, to that parameter setting. If you go below K equals four, you're generally gonna start to undersample. So you want K equals four or above. Let me highlight model three. That's the, the, the key thing here in comparison to the Gaussian model estimator. We are not making any assumptions about the distribution of the points here. And that's why it's so accurate. The cons though are that because it's making fewer assumptions, it's less time efficient than the, uh, the Gaussian model estimator, far less time efficient, but you will get a more accurate result. Fast nearest neighbor searching can reduce this. We have this implemented using what we call KD trees in the JDT toolkit. And this reduces our time complexity from an N squared complexity in the number of samples down to uh, the N log N scale. It still takes a lot longer than the Gaussian estimator though, and you need to keep that in mind if you're doing a lot of calculations on large amounts of data. Okay, let's have a look at using the estimator in uh, JDT. It's very easy. You, uh, we're gonna look at the auto analyzer first. We just select the KSG estimator and we can choose which algorithm there. I'll show you this in just a moment. There are several parameters that we can set, including the number of nearest neighbors K. That's the most crucial one. I generally advise you to leave that at the default of four to make sure it doesn't unsample, as I've already suggested. You can increase that 
if you have lots of samples, if you're dealing with millions of samples, I probably would suggest you start to increase that to get better stability in the results that you are getting. Okay, let's have a quick look at the uh, at the estimator in JRDT. Okay, so here is the auto analyzer where we left it when we looked at the kernel estimator. Let's now switch over to a KSG estimator. I'm going to pick algorithm one here. We'll leave the data set at the two coupled random columns, source column one to source column two. You'll remember before we were looking at a, a mutual information with a time difference of one. I've already highlighted the key parameter here is the number of nearest neighbors. Okay, we're gonna leave that set to four. There are another, a number of other um, properties that we could set here for the estimator. Uh, you can read all about them by hovering on them. Let me just point out a couple of important ones here. The noise level to add, uh, the KSG paper suggests we add a small amount of noise to the data to avoid, uh, to make sure that no two points have exactly the same value. So we had a very small amount of data, uh, amount of noise to the data here, and you should probably leave that in general. Uh, I should also point out that the algorithm uh, impl as implemented in JRT DT is multi-threaded. So it'll grab the, the maximum number of threads that your processor will allow. You can change that here if you like, uh, if you want to use just one thread, for example. There's also GPU capability uh, for this estimator. You can switch that on by checking true from the drop box, uh, drop down box here, but you have that means you need to make sure the CUDA is installed and working on your machine before you do that. Let's run this and have a quick look. So we run it and we get 0.455 nats, which was roughly similar to what we got with the Gaussian model estimator earlier. Much closer to that than the kernel estimator was. Okay, much more stable to the, the parameter settings here. Okay, now let's go back to the slides. The last item I want to point out to you regarding this estimator is to beware that it can return negative values. This doesn't mean the values are wrong. This is a, a frequently asked question that I get. People wonder what, what does it mean when the mutual information returns a negative value here? All that's happening there is that it means that the relationship between the data was estimated as less than what you would expect from the data having no relationship. Okay, because we have bias correction operating on the KSG estimator, when we correct that bias out, sometimes the, the raw result before it was bias corrected could have been lower than what you would expect on average from having no relationship. So that's all it means. A negative value just means it's a value that's consistent with zero. Again, we'll talk about values that are consistent with zero in one of our later sessions. So to finish up, in this session, we've been talking about uh, different information theoretic estimators and the JDT software. What I wanted you to take away was an understanding of the different estimator types and their relative pros and cons. I wanted you to have the ability to use the auto analyzer GUI to make some simple calculations on continuous data, which we've been doing, and to have the ability to extend the code templates to create more complex analyses. It's not something we've covered specifically in the video lectures here, but you will be doing via activities. So I hope we got there. As I say, we're not in class, so we can't really discuss that right now. Coming up, we're gonna to start to take a lot of the theory and the, the practice that we've been covering using JADT and start applying that to uh, uh, using information theory to analyze complex systems proper.